Hi, Kenneth. Welcome to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want podcast. Really glad you could be on today. Hey, glad to be here. Um, so just to get things started, could you just tell people a little bit about who you are and what you do in Web3? Yeah, my name is uh, Kenneth Bell. I run a project called SC Prime. Uh, we are a decentralized distributed storage project. We started in the bear market of 2018. So we've been developing this product now for about five years. And the product's really interesting in that we have the sort of crypto side of things called SC Prime, but we have a product that's actually running over top of it, which is called Exanet Services. So during the interview, I'll probably go back and forth between SCP and XNS, and that's what's going on there. The product is XNS, and then the underlying decentralized network is SC Prime. So what's what kind of background do you have? What made you kind of you know get into this in, in 2018? Yeah, so me and my co-founders, all of us came primarily from the background of video and video production. Um, I'm not even going to tell you how far back I go because it's frightening. But the, the deal is, is that the one sort of overarching feature that goes into that whole world of video production and production machinery and so forth was big storage. And storage is just sort of always underpinned video in, in every kind of way. And it's always been a problematic part of it. And then as everything started going to the cloud, uh, streaming really started taking off and so forth. I, you know, continued to evolve into that way. I was actually in between some contract gigs. I was, a, I'm, I'm both a product designer and I've also been in the sales and marketing side of things. But uh, the deal is, is that I just kind of, I, I had heard about Bitcoin a lot earlier, but just never really fell down the rabbit hole. But then in 2016, I had a little bit of free time on my hands and I started realizing, well, hey, there's some mining I can do. I've got a ton of these graphic cards. Let's go ahead and give this a try. And we found a project called Saya. And Saya okay. actually is decentralized storage as well. But we kind of had a lot of philosophical differences and it didn't take, you know, but more than about a year for me and my co-founders to realize, well, look, let's let's take this. Let's fork the blockchain but let's build something different on top of it. And so that's kind of the genesis of how we kind of came to be. Okay, interesting. Uh, viewers of the show know that Devin and I both have backgrounds in the entertainment industry as well. That's why we got excited about Web3 because sure. of what it does for content creators. So I'm just personally curious, what was your background in video? Were you in like behind the scenes, post-production, pre-production? Yeah. Yeah, I got started a long time ago on building productions and big, you know, seminar, seminar type stuff. You know, back in the old days, people used to use like slideshows and stuff before like PowerPoint. And what happened was we got a hold of the first Macintoshes that could really do video production. And then I kind of followed that along until it came to a point where personal computers could disrupt the Avid workstations because okay. Avid owned the industry. So then we built that for about a decade and we were doing all that until the, the streaming you know, revolution sort of came along. I then got involved with vMix, uh, Telestream. I built award-winning products with both of those companies. And so it's been always about sort of the rigs that actually produce uh, video that I've been involved in. So I've always had a very tight relationship with that, the hard drives that go inside of all these, you know, rigs to capture all of this stuff. Gotcha. Super interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so just at a high level, given that you've now been in this for five years, you know, you've even, you said 2016, so maybe like seven years, you've been thinking about these ideas. What is your vision for Web3 once we're really, you know, living and working inside of Web3? And how is it different than the web that we have today? At a high I'm level. also a net, sure. I'm also a networking professional. So one of the things that that became really clear to me was back in the old days when when networks came around, it was always based on a sort of what was called a client server model. So there was always a big central box and then, you know, they'd hook up to all the individual devices. And then the internet came along and, you know, it kind of decentralized everything. And then very quickly, you know, 
the the magnetism sort of drew things back to big entities you know sort of centralizing everything again and and now we're kind of in that weird place where there's just a handful of companies that really have control of everything and everybody sort of has to hub and spoke into those and so this whole notion of decentralizing the web uh, really hits home with me because I sort of have lived through it already a couple of times. And this just feels to me like a continued, you know, oscillation. I don't see it as any big revolution or anything. I do recognize that back in the 90s, there was a real, you know, dream that we were going to have this world where everybody could be, you know, do what they wanted and blah, blah, blah. And then that got quickly subsumed by, you know, Google and Facebook and all of those guys. And I think we will get the pendulum swinging back the other way. But I still think that there are a lot of um, benefits to having sort of, you know, the best of both worlds. I don't think you can have a complete freeway, right, for instance. We already know that because like undistributed storage is a perfect example. If you had the ability to have permissionless distributed storage where anything goes, you'd have a lot of illegality on that network. You'd have things like, you know, pedophilia and child porn and stuff like that, that, you know, is just really, really bad. And so at some point, then they would find ways to choke point it other ways. And that's, I think that's why crypto gets kind of that kind of reputation because those things tend to bubble up to the surface. And then all the great things that you can do don't always, you know, get the same kind of level. So we aren't really dogmatic about crypto, right? We, we, we don't we didn't come in to solve that problem. We aren't trying to solve the problem of, you know, allowing free speech. That isn't really our thing. Our thing is that the technology underneath can disrupt virtually every other uh, vector that the traditional big companies have. We can disrupt AWS on every single uh, vector. We can disrupt them on price. We can disrupt them on security, performance, durability, and we can do it easily. And this is something that people don't really know about crypto right now because mostly all they hear about crypto is Sam in jail and you know how much <laughs> money did somebody else get ripped off for yesterday, right? So mm-hmm. um, our, our belief is we're on the cusp of being able to show that crypto really can be a better network. So that's mm-hmm. really our, that's our overriding philosophy. Mm-hmm. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so, so now give us, you know, some more of the details about your project in particular. Um, again, at a high level, what you know, what do you guys, do? I get that you're offering storage, but what are, you know, how does it work? You know, what kind of use cases are you targeting? That kind of thing. It's, it's sort of important to understand how storage in the cloud kind of came along. Um, in 94, a guy named Jeff Bezos showed up and he said, hey, this internet thing's pretty cool. I can sell books out of my garage. And he was a hedge fund guy, right? He wasn't like a technologist. He was a hedge fund guy, and but he had the right idea and, and he was, you know, very much on time with it. And so what happened is, is as he started building this online commerce site, you know, the the HTML sites to do what he needed to do, he realized I need to build some infrastructure in order to hold the assets, the, you know, the the databases, all the stuff, and and it needs to be global and it needs to be all of that sort of. And once he built all that out, he realized, you know, I'm not the only one that's going to need this, (laughs) right? So he started building out the AWS side of the house. And then over the course of the next two decades, AWS AWS went on to dominate cloud storage. And mm-hmm. it's been so dominant, it's not even funny. The only reason that Microsoft has able, been able to elbow their way in is because they have the whole office suite of products that everybody uses. And the only reason Google has been able to muscle their way into some percentage is because they have Gmail. So mm-hmm. those three companies literally own like 65% of the cloud storage that's out there. Everybody else is arguing over the other 35%, right? But we have an animating chart that we sort of focus on. And that chart is, is that we're still in that, you know, this part of the curve. And everybody who really looks at storage in the cloud sees that curve over the next two decades doing this. So our belief is, is that we need to sort of build out now and be ready to sort of tackle that. So, okay. So if AWS sort of has all of that thing, How did they sort of get it? Well, the way they got it is they built a protocol. It's not really a protocol. It's more of a de facto or ad hoc protocol 
but they built out S3, Simple Storage Service. That's their underlying foundation. It's where everything lives. It's the hard drives that they build and the servers that they build to serve the storage. And so everybody uses it. It just became the thing. Everybody uses S3. So in our case, the first thing that we said was, well, we're going to have to make this completely and fully S3 compatible. So that's the top layer that we then turn around and bolt on to the bottom layer, which is a decentralized network of permissionless storage nodes that live around the globe. And those storage nodes all talk to each other through, you know, what's called a gossip network, essentially. And they just, it's a mesh network. There's no central controller. They just talk to each other. What we have is we have a blockchain underneath that essentially validates transactions between all of those nodes, like every other blockchain. It's really, in a lot of ways, the SIA, it's the SIA blockchain. And in, in a lot of ways, it, it's our version, our fork of the SIA blockchain. But in, in a lot of ways, it's really just a clone of Bitcoin, except it has a second layer on top of it, an L2 or a layer two as they're kind of known. So people know about those these days from the DeFi world. You know, everybody's talking on Ethereum about the L2s that are providing scalability and so forth. In our case, that second layer is just the contracting layer. And what it does is it allows us to essentially have contracts with nodes in, you know, South Korea or Japan or Europe or America. And the contract, smart contracting that's going along allows us to contract for and put storage on these nodes, right? And then ultimately cryptographically validate and verify that the storage is intact, hasn't been tampered with, isn't, you know, disappeared or any of that sort of stuff. And then if it is at that, at the end of a contract period, then they automatically get paid in our script, which is our coin, SCP, the utility coin. Um, that eliminates so much friction, right? Bankers, lawyers, accountants, you know, the, all kinds of stuff. So, so that's one of the sort of the big things that our product project does is it sort of gets rid of a lot of that big time friction. The second thing that it does is it gets rid of a lot of infrastructure that's unneeded. When AWS builds a data center, it's like $600 million. They've got to sink a giant building. They've got to buy a bunch of servers. They hire a bunch of really you know, well-trained staff 24 seven. But then on top of that, they got to pay like twice as much for equipment just to cool all the equipment that's hosting the storage. So the, the big cost that's involved with it, that, that doesn't exist on our thing. You plug in a little node, you put it in a closet, it doesn't require any extra cooling, doesn't require really anything special in terms of knowledge or technology understanding. You, you know, it's built for grandma to plug in and just make some extra money. And the whole notion about it is, is that that really helps us then to disrupt on the cost vector because we literally have half the cost expenses as AWS or Google or any of those folks do. So what ends up happening then, that's the typical project. By the way, what I just described could describe several projects in the crypto world. Where we differ is that second on top of it, what we'll call layer three, we have this product called Exanet Services. And the key IP that's in there is something called the Relayer. And what the relayer is, it's a specialized client. So when you store your data on AWS, what you do is you establish a relationship, you log in, create an account, get your permissions, and then you set up your URL links to upload your stuff. You use one of 50,000 applications that are S3 compatible. This application we're actually talking on right now probably is saving video up to AWS. So, so the deal there is, is that that all happens without any kind of specialized node. But the problem is the minute it starts going up to AWS, they have control. They have total control of the data. And so they can start doing things on it like deduplication. They can, you know, put it wherever they want. They can take it offline. They can do all sorts of stuff, but they have control. In the relayer case, we are finally returning control to the customer, right? You stand up the relayer and feed the stuff to the cloud. So the first thing it does is it encrypts it with military grade encryption, little, you know, stupid term, but 
the, the big thing that it does is it does something called erasure coding. And erasure coding is slivering the data into like 120 pieces and then pushing it out to nodes. And the nodes in the relayer, you choose. So you can go to map.xns.tech and you can actually see our live nodes. And you choose those nodes that you're going to be staving your stuff off to. So you have control, first of all, where it's gonna live, right? And you can choose on lots of criteria. You can choose fast nodes. You can choose nodes that you know have big capacity. We're gonna to continue to add more and more tags to feature. So you can choose like continuous time and serve it, all kinds of things. But what ends up happening then is I never see your data. I never see your metadata. I never see anything about your data, right? So I have no control over your data. The only relationship we have is as customers, you pay me to use our storage. And then we have the central contractor right now, right? So what happens is you sign a term of service with us to say that you're not going to put illegal stuff online. If you put illegal stuff online and you're in, you know, Iowa and we get a call from the FBI and the FBI says, look, here's some stuff. You have to agree this is illegal. Here's the, you know, federal statute. What happens now? Well, we're going to warn the customer. We're going to say, look, you can't do that because you agreed you wouldn't do that. Take it down, please. And, you know, so forth. And if they don't take it down, we can just shut the contract off. We can't do anything with their data. We still can't see it. We still can't control it. But we can actually disable their contract and take them offline. If there's a, a, a negotiation or anything like that, right now, they would have to go deal with AWS. But they don't come deal with us because I don't have your data. I've never seen your data. I don't know where your data lives. I don't know anything about your data. So the relationship goes now back between you and the authorities. And if you feel like you have something to take to court and free speech issues, fine, go and 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 you can battle that out. And, and now it's a direct one-to-one -one relationship with the content creator and the store of the data. So that's kind of how that all works. And so getting back that implicit control is the real big key for us. The relayer is fully S3 compatible, works with almost everything we've thrown at it. And then at the end of all of that, so, so once you sort of have all that, that gets us into sort of a web 2.5-ish, let's call it that, right? We have an evolutionary path because we don't believe that customers right now, if I go out and try and sell to a customer, we don't believe they're going to want you know, to buy crypto, to hold it, to sure, put it sure, into sure. contracts, to do that. So when we get to a point, maybe a year from now, two years from now, whatever it's going to take, where things start to get a little bit more clear regulatory wise, and people feel more comfortable and the memories of Sam have long disappeared. The, uh, the deal is, is that there will be some early adopters who will say, no, you know, let us go ahead and contract ourselves and let us use the crypto ourselves. And all we have to do is push the contractor out to them. Right. So so our strategy envisions that within about two to five years time, a very healthy portion of our network will be fully decentralized in Web3. And we have processes in place to monetize that and how that all works. But we think that for the first uh, couple, two or three, and by the way, our product just launched on July 1st. So congratulations. We're, we're, yeah, thank you. We're just now live. So we think it's going to take one to three years for that really to, to come into play. And so our salespeople are going to be out there. You know, I can, I can envision sales calls where the crypto never even comes up. Mm -hmm. Nobody sure. even asks about the blockchain because all they really care about is security and my data. So I have a, a couple of questions to make sure that I understood everything. Um, your, so the data is being, I guess my first question is, are the providers of the storage and the providers of the consensus mechanism, are they um, two separate groups or do they have to do both? Yeah, this is this is an interesting part of our project, and it actually caused some some grief for the SIA people because what happened in if you if you're around in 2017, 2018, you know, proof of work and utility was really the big sort of thing. And then when we got into 2020, it kind of got, in my view, to be a little bit of a silly season. But 
I do understand the value of NFT and obviously DeFi is a thing and it's it's certainly going to disrupt finance at some point in time. But what ended up happening was, is everybody sort of moved into a different world and stopped looking at proof of work as, you know, the sort of this really the best underlying con consensus mechanism. So in our case, the answer, direct answer to your question is they are two separate things right now. We have a, a permissionless mining that happens to validate the blockchain. We're about five years through the emission schedule. We're pretty well flatlined now on the emission. Um, you know, we ultimately will be somewhere around a 55 million coin supply when it's all done. We're like at 53 right now. So we're very close to the end of the game there as far as that. And it'll just be the ongoing transactions. But what we envision is this, and we've said this really for a long time, we expect over the next one to three years, just as we expect to transition into full Web3, we also expect to transition out of this consensus model to one that does shift the consensus validation over to the storage nodes. Right now, the storage nodes have no role in consensus. All they do is sit, provide storage, storage proofs are cryptographically pulled, and then ultimately they get paid. But um, we do have a secondary token, which doesn't list on any exchanges right now, that ultimately will become a staking token. It, it may not be perfect proof of stake. It'll probably be some blended model uh, proof of storage. We already run storage proof, so that will be part of it. I suspect I'm talking with people at Polygon right now, for instance. I'm talking with a few of the L1, L2 people. I just don't think so like. Helium is a good example as a as a, a deal because they switched to Solana right out of their own mm -hmm. blockchain. And we think we're going to have to do that. But there are still a lot of really valuable um, things like scalability. We can scale to the moon on our own blockchain right now. If we got onto Ethereum, if you remember last year, um, like Filecoin and storage, they had problems because when the um, fees get so high, it makes it hard for them to pay their nodes on the network correctly. And so that then things get to be very challenging. So maybe two years is probably my guess that we move that and we, we bring them together to answer the question, but right now they are separate. Okay. So they're separate. So, and so the storage providers are hosting the content and the consensus providers are essentially the smart contracts that are making sure that those nodes are hosting the content. Is that right? They're executing the so, smart contracts. Well, the, the so the miners and they run on ASICs, by the way, they are, you know, pretty expensive pieces of equipment. And so the, the miners obviously don't really care much about, they don't even have to know anything about the product, right? Or the project. They just, all they need to do is plug in and earn money and, and they do, and that's what they do. And what they do is same as on Bitcoin is they validate the transactions, every transaction that goes across. What's interesting about our thing is, so one of the reasons why other projects have had a lot of problems with scalability is that um, as we store something on a node, what ends up happening is between, say, today and 30 days from now, which is typically what storage does, runs on 30 day cycles, um, there's going to be lots of things that happen. I'll upload stuff, I'll download stuff, you know, maybe edit something or whatever. And so as those changes get made in that storage that's being stored, there's little microtransactions that are taking place. You know, some money's changing hands or at least the invoice is going up, right? As it happens or going down if they're deleting data or whatever. So there's a there's a an ongoing thing. If we transactionalized all that, it would overwhelm the blockchain. So we don't. What happens is all of that transactional traffic gets moved up into that layer two. So there's only three transactions on every 30 day contract. There's an opening contract, there's a final revision, and then there's the storage proof. And those three get printed to the blockchain. And it's okay. those three transactions that the miners, the, the physical miners are validating. And then that provides the auditable, publicly legible uh, blockchain transaction log that everybody can look in and ensure that we're not cheating anybody or, you know, so forth and such. Okay. That makes sense. So, and all of the data I assume is end to end encrypted. 
that's going yes. out to the storage nodes. So you brought up the issue of what I like to call universally abhorrent content, right? Uh, child sexual abuse material, let's say, you know, things that involve kind of like violence that are uh, not, I, I don't want to go there. Anyway, right, there's just universally abhorrent content that shouldn't, that I don't want to host on my node. It's illegal. Uh, I am confused as to how terms of service are enough to make sure that that isn't entering your network and also how you would discover that it exists if it's fully encrypted end to end. The terms of service don't prevent it from entering the network. That That is, uh, you know, part and parcel of this whole thing is, is that as we drive to more liberty and, and this, you know, sort of freedom that we're all sort of seeking, um, that ability to actually have the stuff on the network itself um, is not what we're trying sort of to prevent. So, so the terms of service says, you know, you can't publicly share this, right? We're not, we're not encouraging it by any stretch. What we're saying is, is the minute some entity who has, you know, legal responsibility contacts us and says, hey, somebody shared this link with us. This link was publicly available and it contained this information, which is illegal, according to the statute. What are you going to do about it? We will then warn the customer and say, look, you're in violation of the terms of service. There's nothing to stop any of our customers from, you know, building a private folder of a bunch of really nasty stuff and then just keeping it internally. Now, if one of their employees stands up and calls in the cops on them and says, hey, internally, we've got a bunch of people doing all this illegal stuff. Well, that's breaking the law and they're going to end up, that's how it will surface to the, to the public. But it's like this thing with Apple last year, you know, where they were talking about, we're going to go in and we're going to look at all your iCloud stuff. And if we see stuff that we don't like, we're going to make some judgments for you. Mm -hmm. And everybody just stood up and said, whoa, wait a second. How much is an Android phone again? Um, because, you know, that's just not the way you handle it. The way you handle it is you say, look, we can't stop you from putting stuff on computers you own, right? Mm -hmm. And if you turn around and put them up onto this network and it's enclosed and private and it's just for you to share amongst you and yourself, I mean, we're never going to see it. So, you know, that's the deal there. And, and I don't think, by the way, that that problem, I don't think that that problem really has a solution, by the way. I think there are people that will disagree with that understanding, but freedom has a cost. Freedom is messy. Certainly. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, is there, if I am offering storage as a service and being paid for that, and I'm getting you're saying, I, I forget the term that you used, but it sounded sort of like sharding. You're splitting up the content and sending- It is sharding, yeah. Okay, so you're sending pieces of it to different storage providers and I receive one of them. How can I know, how can I know that it's not some of that universally, is there a way for me to know that? Do, do, am I no. automatically decrypting it? Am I storing encrypted data that I don't know what is there? How does how can I know that I'm not storing something I don't want to be storing? You're storing one one twentieth of any given upload that's being sent out, and the, the uploads are you know packed rows of files, and it's encrypted. So you you as a provider, you're never going to know what you have on your node, and that's purposeful. You just you just have this stuff. Okay. Now the way we indemnify you, right? So when right now on the thing, we don't have this switch where it's closed, we're about to implement it. But what so what we have to do as a decentralized project, right, partially because the SEC and other entities is, you know, there is still an open source uh, module out there. People could use our network at, like SIA. They could use it using the original SIA related type tools. They suck. They, they aren't very good but they work, they at least allow you to upload and download and stuff. So that exists. You can download that and you can use it. And, and that data does go out to all of the nodes that XNS uses. But what we're going to allow our providers to do is to choose. They will be able to say, look, I don't want 
data from the world. I don't want it from every, you know, individual who just can anonymously download the software. I only want it from XNS because XNS is protecting us through the terms of service with the customers. That's the only data I want. So we're going to allow our network to sort of self-form and self-organize to say that's all we want. And we think that 100% of our nodes are going to want to do that because we charge them money for them. It's like it's a it's a $450 license to buy onto the network or you buy an XA miner, which has a, a license already built into it. So in those cases, they're already got skin in the game. They're, they're data okay. center owners. So that deal is, is they will be able to choose and say, we only want XNS data. And XNS says to the customers, we only want legal data, right? So it, it's not a perfect scenario, but we think it's going to cover 98% of the potential things that will happen. Okay. Gotcha. So I mean, obviously, this sounds like it's a competitor to Filecoin. There's other decentralized protocols that you mentioned too, Saya, Arweave, StoreJ, but Filecoin is by far the biggest. And I I guess I'm curious why you felt like you needed to make a competitor to Filecoin and what what's <laughs> different about it or, or you know. Every, everything right up until that last sentence, I was right there with you. And then I'm like, make it competitor. When we started, Filecoin, actually in 2016, Filecoin did a $250 million ICO that still to this day hasn't been adjudicated yet as legal or not. So we'll see how that turns out. Look, I applaud them. I think what they're doing is something interesting. And I think they will ultimately get share. The thing that animates us, right? We show this in everything that we do. And I, I, I don't have a I don't think I have a way to screen share here with you, but we have a chart that we show. And the chart essentially is that flat line until about 2025. And then storage starts to do this. And what it shows is, is about 2035, the prediction is, is that we're going to be like exponentially higher than we are right now. And it's really easy to understand how that happens. You know, you guys being uh, entertainment folks understand this. When you went from the old original 480p video up to 1080p, you know, or then you went from sure. 1080 to 4K. It yeah. isn't a doubling. It's not a doubling of data. It's an exponential growth. It's 16x, right? Because you're getting that much extra data. So the data is doing this. It's like same thing with like you'd get a CAT scan or a CT or whatever. And the same thing. They want higher resolution. They want more slight cops wearing, you know, cameras and everything. They want higher, all the video surveillance. Yeah, you can argue over whether it's good or bad. But at the same time, you can't argue that it's shedding off a ton of data. So from our perspective in 2016 and 2017, when we were into this, nobody knew what Juan Benet was doing and what, you know, Filecoin was about. And if you remember, it took them like three years to even get their coin to market. So, you know, it was what it was. What they had was they had a new protocol called IPFS and it's a good protocol. And I, I think it's interesting. But the thing about it is, is Will IPFS subsume everything else and essentially all the businesses that are essentially focused on a, uh, the S3 uh, RESTful API and, and working in that direction, will they throw all that out and go with IPFS? I don't think so. My, personally, that's my own belief. Now, what they've done at Filecoin recently, and you know, how can you blame them? They've shifted their sort of, they pivoted a little bit, right? We have a model to move into compute, to move into CDN, to move into all the other AWS services that are there. They jumped right away. They're focused really heavily now all of a sudden on compute, whereas a year ago it was all about storage. And yet they don't really even have any real use on their network. They have internal use that they brought in from, you know, some things and they give away storage for free because their their coin emission is still, you know, somewhere like 25%, 20% FTV on that thing is way out, you know, into years from now. So, so the deal there is, is we don't look like we're competing, like, like, like we're competing with it. We see everybody is competing with us. And I'll, I'll explain that. S storage. And I don't know how to say their name. You said storage. I hear so many people. I, I don't know how you name a company. <laughs> Nobody knows oh, how yeah, to name storage. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, in, anyway, we have a bigger network than they do, right? They don't even use blockchain, by the way, for their contracting. People don't understand this. There's not even a blockchain underneath their deal. If you read their white paper, they actually come out and say, we don't like blockchain, 
right? Um, I, I shouldn't focus too much on the competitors, but I will say we have a bigger network than them. We have a bigger network than SIO. We have bigger, are we isn't even really in this game. They're in a completely different niche. People shouldn't confuse what they're doing with anything that we're doing because it's something completely different. Um, whether it works or not, I'll be watching because I'd like to see whether it works, but um, I don't even consider them. So it really is us and Filecoin at this point. So it did come down to that, but it didn't start that way. And, and we think we actually have a strategy that gets us into businesses quickly. We think that within five years, we will be just another well-known name serving cloud storage to a lot of businesses around the world. I don't think that's going to be the case with the IPFS Filecoin network thing. I think what they're going to do is, and they don't have to, by the way, but cats off to that ICO process and to the ability to shed off a whole bunch of coins that are valuable over the next five years so that you never really have to deliver a truly working product. It's just an ecosystem now. And essentially people are building all kinds of things to bolt onto it. And it could turn into a very valuable uh, you know, set of real estate. But how much of that big storage they ultimately end up capturing is still a big, wide open unknown. So in our case, we're just going to go after the business. And if we get the business, then we'll turn around and decentralize underneath that, right? Their, their deal is we want to build this giant decentralized ecosystem, and then we'll go out and we'll tackle business. I don't know the, con look, you're a 38 or 45 year old, you know, uh, C-suiter, you know, you CFO or, or CTO or something like that. And you sit down in a conversation and you, you know, the, the pitch is, we want you to essentially buy a bunch of these coins, keep them in a wallet, you bank on those, and then you set up all your own front ends and stuff. You can work with all of these different partners to, to sort of bolt together your stuff. And you start to look into it and you go, man, I'm going to have to do all this work myself. At the end of it, how am I going to be assured of security and durability? And there's no SLA underneath it. I don't have any guarantees. Who do I go to see when I have problems? It's like you're putting all the responsibility on me. And I don't even know all that much about AWS. I rely on a managed service provider to help me with my own cloud, right? So we think we're still probably five years away from people wanting that responsibility. And that's why we think we beat everybody right now in crypto, because everybody in crypto wants to turn that responsibility over. And they think people are going to it's the field of dreams thing. And and we've seen that, you know, nobody's yeah, totally. Playing yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been in crypto since 2014 and have been shocked at how little progress we've made to some degree, you know, because a lot of it's of UI kind of stuff, too, isn't it? it? You know, it's like if UIs were more friendly or I think mm -hmm. people want to use this stuff more. But mm -hmm. our UIs are just like made a mask. Come on. I love it. But, you know, learning it is like rocket science. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so I'm just going to push back on that a little bit because uh, going into this interview, I hadn't heard of your project and I, you know, we've used IPFS. I've, we know Juan from way back. So I, and, and obviously it's the biggest name in crypto to some degree, right there, or, or it's one of the biggest projects, especially in that space. So if they are your main competitor and you are going to wipe the floor with them, when are people like, what's going to be the thing that takes you, you know, into the public consciousness and, and has you be more known and more used how is that going to happen or, or what what clients do you already have that maybe people don't know about or, or what, you know, how's, how does that success work? Um, well, first of all, we're not going to wipe the floor with anybody. We, we don't look at it like that. We look at it as that chart being a rising tide is going to raise all boats. We think that there's going to be a vast Great, need awesome. for storage from all kinds of projects. So yep. from our perspective, we just think we're the leading uh, tool set right now that uses a blockchain underneath it. Now, at the end of the day, the reason why you know about them, you don't know about us is because $250 million does that, right? Mm -hmm. They've got a ton of Silicon Valley money behind them. They've got a whole bunch of stakeholder-y type, you know, claim on that whole thing. And so there's a lot of power and energy and ability to get out there, do conferences, do a lot of marketing, to do ecosystem work, to do all that. We've done none of that. We bootstrapped our entire project from nothing, right? We have angel investors. We're still in a pre-seed, 
you know, stance. We have a bunch of guys who essentially, you know, took a pitch and saw and understood what we were trying to build and said, yes, I, I get that totally. We use data in our own thing. So, so we've raised a grand total of what? Two million bucks. We don't have a giant chunk of our own emission right? It's like, if you go through and look at the pie chart on other projects and you see, look, one of the other names he mentioned, and I'm going to stop actually naming them by, by thing, but one of the other names had a big ICO in 2016 and they're sitting on 50% of their own emission, 50%. That, that means at some point uh, along the, the road, they're going to be dumping those coins on their community, right? We saw that with our, the, project we've worked from last year when they ran into, you know, uh, a bit of a schism, they went and they turned around and said, look, we're going to fork the blockchain and we're going to give ourselves 2 billion coins. And then they turned around and dumped them completely on the market and took 18 million bucks and put it in their own wallets. We, we don't have any of that. We're broke, right? We're essentially grinding along because we believe all of our team believes in what we're building. And our belief is this, you know, I, I built some award winning products for, like I said, uh, some of the streamers and so forth that are out there. The product itself should actually make you rich. In crypto, the thing that bothers me most about crypto is that too many entities in this space have essentially already had career defining financial success without ever having released anything that anybody uses, right? I mean, millions and millions, even hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, to me, that's just, that's anathema. In our view, what we're going to keep doing is grinding along. We're going to start selling the product. As we start selling the product, and we just started on July, as I said, we will go out and start talking to traditional VCs. We won't be looking for coin VCs that want to come in and get 50% of some emission so that they can rug down the road on people. We're going to be looking for traditional venture backing to do series seed. And then as we get into series seed, then you're going to start hearing our name. But even then you might not because most of our marketing and advertising will be out in the real world to people in business that need to store, you know, data on networks. There, right. You're there's definitely not a lot of B than B2C and that's going to be. Absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I, I completely, <laughs> I love your philosophy um and i'm surprised at that by the way because i kind of thought i was gonna i didn't know if i was gonna get web3 on this call to to where oh you guys are web3 and you know blah 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 so i appreciate that <laughs> um i mean i i always say this it's so apologies to those of you that have listened to all my content but i think that the price action is by far the most boring thing about the crypto space i don't like that it drives so much of the attention and um, I don't know, I guess attention is the right word, uh, because it's not, it's not meaningful to the progress of web three. The progress of web three yeah. is about sovereignty. It's about, you know, having direct connections between people and between, for me, between creators and their audiences, right? The idea of share right. cropping on these platforms is dangerous and scary and limits the ability for creators to make the kinds of cool things that I think that they would make otherwise. And so the, all of the flurry around the stonks is so boring and is also sadly what most crypto content is about. Like you said, you were worried I was going to like web three you and make it all about <laughs> that kind of stuff. And it's just right. like, that content matters so little in terms of how meaningful Web3 can be in our day-to-day -day life, in the average person's day-to-day -day life and use of the web, use of the internet. So, right. yeah, absolutely. And I think that the abstraction of that, the thing that really, in my view, that that is frustrating is that tribalism ultimately leads, you know, to that place where it becomes politicized. We're already seeing it now. And if like, for instance, crypto gets you know, chunked into that red v blue box, which is a completely non-existent construct that's been built just to, to control us, then we're lost, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole thing should be, this should be about the empowerment of the individual, not, you know, some enrichment of one group over some enrichment of another. And that's, that's my biggest fear is, is that it does turn into more of a tribal. Um, well, the other problem with the tribalist 
aspect that I think is so odd that it gets overlooked is that what it's essentially doing is recreating the walled garden model because we have all of these protocols that don't work interoperably despite saying that Web3 is all about interoperability and about right, things right, right. working together and about, right? So it's just like, it makes no sense. But what you have are these, you know, protocols that are building something that that didn't set up their incentive mechanisms in a way that makes that incentivizes app developers to use their protocols. So then the protocol devs have to build the app that the end users use, and then you just have this new silo. And it's like, aren't we trying to leave Web two, <laughs> the siloed walled gardens of Web two, and you know, be in this like open jungle of Web three? And anyway. On that note, actually, I want to skip over to the question of standards. So I'm not saying, I, I'm not asking if you know what the standard should be, but I'm at, or standards should be like you know exactly what line it should be or what you know if the, you know, <laughs> how the formatting of the code should actually be. What I'm asking is if there are areas that you think need to be standardized so that some of these protocols can work better and so that we can have more developers building at that application layer for end users? Well, I think if you think about how the internet rolled out, and, and I think this has been the biggest frustration for crypto is that, so I, I went through the 90s and provisioned internet for people and, and internet did have that you know real rapid growth and, and so forth. And it got used a lot right out of the gate. And part of that is because the protocols that were sort of launched that allowed for the internet to take off TCP IP and the various kinds of protocols that were out there at the time, um, they weren't, you know, built to monetize. They weren't, they didn't have coins right. behind them. They were just guys did really good engineering, put it out for the world, the world adopted it and we saw giant growth and then it got co-opted. So now we're kind of in this weird place where people are developing and releasing protocols, but Hey, I want to get paid for it, you know? And so, then that, of course, does the, the wall garden of that you're talking. So I could see IPFS turning into something, you know, standardized. I could see that happening and it wouldn't that wouldn't bother us. I mean, we could easily transition over to run on virtually any protocol that's underneath. But I think what I think has happened in our space is, is it's more of that middle protocol layer that we're focused on right now in that we need to go out and get real world adoption. So you know, if you talk about the money, one of the things where the money makes sense is this. So the reason why IPFS and why we talk about Filecoin even really exists, because they went to Silicon Valley and they got real money to come into the space. Right. And then once the money comes into space, it's sort of the money just gets folded into that big hot ball of crypto money and it chases all the whatever narrative is that's hot and so forth. But there's not new, you know, growth coming into the space. In our belief system, we aren't looking for money from anybody in crypto. We aren't trying to partner with other crypto companies. We aren't doing any of that. What our belief is, is that if we go out and we find real businesses on this API layer, the S3 protocol that they're already on and bring them in, it will be this new money thing. It will be all this money coming in to sort of drive adoption and drive use and drive, you know, scale into our thing. And then underneath that, like I said, we plan to move to a different L1 or a different L2 in the future. So we don't know yet exactly what protocol that's going to live on or, or what our consensus, you know, layer is going to look like or so forth. But when we get there, we'll make the same pragmatic decisions that we've made all along. And we'll say, OK, so, you know, right now, if I had to guess, if I had to bet, I'm going to say, you know, Solana is going to be there just because they've got so much, you know, impetus underneath them. Ethereum obviously is going to be this thing. So if they ever get the scalability and performance worked out. So so. Yeah, there's all these other ones. There's all these L2s. There's all these people that are vying to get in there. But like everything else, there's going to be one or two winners, right? Sure. There will be one or two winners that will that will shake out as being the most performant, the most productive, the, the least, you know, cost uh, constrictive. And we feel like that will be the time for us to bring our big pile of customers and drop them down onto those 
protocols. So I don't really care so much about developing on the, the underlying protocols at this point. I think it's in good hands with all the people that are doing that computer science. I think at our at, at our point, we're at the place where we just need to go out and get customers and bring them into this thing and introduce them to a better decentralized storage. Okay, got it. That makes sense. So it sounds like the next steps on your roadmap are bringing in customers. Is there anything else that you want to share with the audience? Well, we have a lot of different products. We've actually, we've shipped five products now and we've got about three or four additional products that we'll be shipping over the next uh, couple of quarters. They have to do with specialized nodes or relayers or uh, different kinds of, you know, uh, devices that live at, at, at different locations, customer versus, uh, you know, the, the, the network node. So we definitely have a number of different products that we're shipping. We just put one out that's called Relayer MT, which is so a data center operator can stand up this Relayer thing and then on a one button click provision Relayers for new customers. Relayers are server instances, so they do require a little bit of knowledge and handholding. So this will make that process of onboarding customers. We're not really selling. We do sell direct to the public. You can come to the website, you can buy storage. But we expect that we're going to sell through partners more in the beginning. We're going to sell through what used to be called VARs, value-added resellers. They're now called MSPs, managed storage providers or service providers. And that, so those are the people we're sort of working on. So that that is pretty much the next two to four quarters, our focus on really evangelizing uh, that layer of sales, you know, and, you know, uh, evangelism and onboarding storage. And in that case, it's like a flywheel. I'll give you one last sort of thing on that. So like Helium, and I really, I'm really impressed with this company. See, these guys started in 2013. They went for several years. They didn't do anything. It was really difficult for them. And then they discovered a tokenized, you know, background to a network. And all of a sudden it went like this. Mm -hmm. They went from like 2000 nodes to a million nodes in like two years. It was, it was incredible. That is incredible. But they didn't have anything to use the network, right? right. So now there's probably what, like 400,000 nodes active on the network and 600,000 unsatisfied people, right? So that's that that was both the way to do it and not the way to do it. So we learned an awful lot from them. In 2021, we had one of those little bumps and I, I did this. I said, no, 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 we can't do that. I could have I could have onboarded like five or 10,000 additional nodes. And I said, no. It's not time yet. And so we didn't do it. Now we're ready. Now we're sort of ready to start that growth because we're selling on the other side. This is going to bring in the storage. So now we can get that network growth to take us up to hopefully the same levels that they're on and do the same thing that they're doing. So that that is the, the next two to four quarters. It's bringing in new customers, bringing in people to this thing getting them to use the whole thing, and then slowly but surely decentralizing it through pushing the contractor out to them. Okay, awesome. You mentioned at the top that you were waiting for more regulatory clarity for to be able to do certain things. What is your message to regulators? What do you need? I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous the, the, the way it's all transpired. I mean, you can't look at it and understand anything else but how ridiculous it is. The investors are not being protected. In fact, in, in a lot of ways, they've created an environment for investors to get fleeced. And I think that's what 2022 was all about. I think I think that's what it really highlighted. Good, solid regulation back in 2018 would have precluded a lot of that stuff. So what I think needs to happen is, is that I think we need projects like this. I noticed that, you know, a lot of your stakeholders, people like LivePeer, um, you know, those kinds of projects. I think I think people need to see real stuff now. And I think as more real stuff shows up on the market, the people in positions of regulatory authority will start to recognize, wait, at first we thought it was going to change the world. Then we realized in 2022 is all just nonsense and scams. We need to get an equilibrium and get back to saying, wait, there's still some world changing stuff here. We need to focus on that. We need to protect people, but at the same time, give freedom. We need to continue. So the message to regulators is to look at real products, I think. I think the message to everybody right now is look at real products. If there's no utility underneath, if they're just trying to be new money, I mean, 
that doesn't really mean anything to me. What means something to me is using network technology to improve the, 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 the ability to access products and to use products and tools so that we don't have to suffer through Elon versus Musk uh, or for Zuck type, you know, MMA bouts. I mean, to me, this is the world that we've created for ourselves and we don't deserve it. Ooh, we don't deserve it. All right. I like that. <laughs> um, yes, completely agreed. Infrastructure is the foundation of prosperity. 80 years ago in America, we invested in the physical infrastructure of our country, and that has led to tremendous prosperity. And the next frontier is the digital world. And we must invest in that infrastructure for America to continue to be prosperous. And you know, Web3 infrastructure is is that infrastructure, is that real use case that you're talking about that's going to be so meaningful and that's going to change the current infrastructure to a far, far better one. And so we need to be able to build that here in the U.S. We need U.S. citizens to be able to participate in offering those resources to, you know, drive that infrastructure. Completely agreed. Uh, so final question. It's the name of the show. What kind of Internet do you want? Wow, that's a <laughs> that's kind of a tough question. Um, I, I just want faster internet. I live in a a weird little island. I live in a uh, uh, college town in Colorado, and it's interesting because around the country, almost every metropolitan area, there's two ISPs, and usually one's dominant. And you just don't have choice, right? You just do not get choice. And if you try and get choice, like the municipality tries to do something to drive choice, you get sued and they win. And what happens is, is Comcast and, you know, uh, just a few companies have essentially, you know, landlocked us. And in my little community that I live in, it's really weird because my town actually did manage to pass a municipal internet service and it's, it's blazing fast and it's really good. But for whatever reason, the little condo community I live in hasn't yet given them permission to put in the, the fiber interconnect. So I can't get it. So I'm, I'm paying several hundred dollars for what amounts to like a 50 megabit upload. Right. Which oh, in yeah. 2023 is ridiculous. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm using a modem. <laughs> right. <laughs> so how are we supposed to do this kind of communication if we're being hamstrung by these providers? And so that is the next step. And that, and that isn't what helium is about necessarily, but it is what that 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 impetus goes to is so so that's really I think to my way of thinking that that is the kind of Internet I want. I want one where two companies aren't essentially telling me what my road to get onto it is in 21st century America, right? I mean, that makes mm -hmm. no sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, MeshNet, here we come. Sounds pretty yes. good to me. <laughs> Thank you, Kenneth. This was a fascinating conversation. I really appreciate your time. Hey, I really appreciate you guys having us on. We haven't been out really talking to people. We haven't been doing much of this stuff. Um, I'm always happy to talk about what we're doing and I'm always ha happy to talk about the project. It's a really good project. It's got a lot of great people involved. The team is is stellar and the community is just dynamite. The thing about it is, is that, um, you know, I think now's the kind of the time to raise the profile. So I really appreciate you having me on. On that note, where can people find you? So scpri.me is the, the crypto side, SC Prime, and then xns.tech is the product side, the, the network product side. And I think those are the two big things. And then, of course, we spend all our time in Discord, which is, to me, Discord is in some ways sort of a great way about how it can work because you don't really pay much money to use discord and yet discord can do a lot of things like zoom and all these other tools uh we're at discord.gg forward slash sc prime awesome thank you so much looking forward to what you guys build okay thanks <laughs>